Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Keeping an Eye on the Geopolitical Ball with me, Jamie Shea, Senior Fellow at uh, Friends of Europe. I hope you uh, all enjoyed the summer break and are ready for a new season of our weekly uh, eye recordings. Now, while many of you were away on the beaches, uh, if you kept an eye on the news, particularly on Ukraine, you would have seen that the big story uh, of August uh, going into September has been concerns regarding the safety of the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant in eastern Ukraine. This is Europe's uh, largest uh, nuclear power plant uh, with uh, six uh, reactors, uh, which supplies about 25% of uh, Ukraine's electricity needs. Um, it was occupied by Russian forces soon after Putin invaded uh, uh, Ukraine on the 24th of uh, uh, February. But as the fighting shifted uh, in April and May uh, from the Kiev region uh, into the Donbass region, and particularly around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, uh, concerns started to grow because the Ukrainians were accusing Russia, having uh, occupied the plant, of using it as uh, a military base and firing out of the plant uh, into uh, Ukrainian villages and towns in the neighborhood, uh, Russia believing that, of course, uh, the Ukrainians would never dare to shoot back uh, because that would pose a danger to the nuclear reactors. Meantime, Russia predictably has uh, been accusing the Ukrainians of reckless behavior uh, by shelling uh, into the vicinity of the plant. Uh, in the meantime, uh, a Ukrainian team has remained uh, at Zaporizhia uh, to keep the plant running, uh, although because of the disruption to the power lines, uh, which uh, feed uh, the safety mechanisms and the cooling systems of the nuclear reactors, uh, five of the reactors have had to be shut down um, and only uh, one is still uh, running. Uh, now, the international community, right from the beginning of August, became increasingly alarmed about this situation because we all remember uh, Chernobyl. Uh, back in 1986, uh, when uh, there was an accident in a nuclear power plant in Ukraine close to the border with Belarus. And at that time, a radioactive cloud spread far and wide over Europe, uh, reaching as far as the United Kingdom uh, and uh, uh, Norway, uh, with the dangers to public health, to crops, to water supplies, and everything that you can uh, imagine. So um, an accident, or deliberate or otherwise, at a nuclear power plant in Ukraine is not just a big danger for Ukrainians, but of course for the uh, rest of Europe as well. So the international community has been calling on Russia to withdraw its troops from the uh, plant and has been supporting the efforts of Rafael Grossi, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, and his team to gain access to the plant uh, to check uh, on the safety uh, uh, situation. Finally, at the beginning of September, after much toing and froing, uh, and particularly pressure on, on Russia, uh, Rafael Grossi and his team were able to gain access to the plant uh, and reported uh, extensively uh, on the situation, which is that there is indeed a, a large danger because of the disruption to the power lines and continuous uh, shelling, uh, that uh, the, the reactors, uh, of course, could be uh, severely uh, affected, even the one which is uh, still uh, uh, running. Uh, Grossi has uh, since, uh, fortunately, been able to leave some of his inspectors at Zaporizhia uh, to keep an eye uh, on the uh, safety uh, uh, provisions and to pull the alarm call should there be uh, a danger. But meanwhile, of course, uh, uh, the fighting continues, as we've seen in recent days, particularly in the region. And so despite the IAEA inspection, we're certainly not out of the uh, woods yet. Now, what does all of this mean? Well, it has raised the big issue about the safety of nuclear plants. Um, we've seen in recent years in Three Mile Island, back in the 70s in the United States, and more recently with Fukushima uh, in in Japan, uh, where a nuclear reactor was disrupted as a result of a, uh, a, a tsunami, that nuclear power plants uh, are vulnerable both to extreme weather events and natural causes, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, as well as to uh, human error, as in Chernobyl, or deliberate military uh, activity, for instance, uh, bombing uh, the plants uh, to cause a deliberate environmental hazard. 
And, and this issue is not going to get any better uh, as the years go by, because one of the uh, consequences of the uh, uh, rising uh, gas and oil uh, prices that we see today, uh, largely on the back, of course, of the uh, war in Ukraine and Putin's decision recently to shut down the Nord Stream 1 uh, gas pipeline that uh, supplies Germany and Europe. One of the consequences is a number of countries have decided that maybe there is a future in nuclear power after all. Uh, number one, because you can largely control it yourself, uh, as long as you can uh, uh, pro uh, uh, provision the uranium and so on that you need. But uh, it's not quite the same as being dependent upon a foreign power to supply you with gas and oil. Number two, because the it, it does not pollute the environment. Uh, it's carbon neutral, even if, of course, there is always the problem of what to do with the uh, waste. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, for example, Germany, which had decided to close two nuclear power plants, uh, has reversed that decision and said that maybe it will prolong their lives uh, after all. Countries like Finland, the United Kingdom and others are uh, looking also at the future of nuclear power. In the meantime, the British company Rolls-Royce has developed so-called uh, uh, small modular reactors. Um, in other words, the ability to get into the nuclear power generation business uh, at about six a billion dollars a plant, still a lot of money, but much smaller than the 15 to 20 billion dollars a plant that a conventional nuclear reactor, pressurized water a, a, a reactor plant will cost you. And therefore, it's very tempting for a number of states to start nuclear power programs uh, so that they can at least ensure their energy security uh, and deal, of course, with rising gas and oil prices. Uh, at the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency calculates that there are already 550 nuclear reactors in the world today. Uh, and so with these small, cheaper modular versions, that number could go well over to 1,000 in, in the next couple of years. So that means that there are potentially far more nuclear power plants where things could go wrong, particularly if they are in conflict areas where we could have a repeat of Zaporizhia in terms of uh, an invading army occupying a nuclear power plant and using it to blackmail, uh, uh, for example, the international uh, community into making uh, concessions. So what needs to be done? Well, we badly, therefore, need an international treaty uh, on the safety of nuclear uh, power plants. So Rafael Grossi, together with the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has mapped out some of the main parameters, which is that these power plants should be surrounded by a, a recognized demilitarized zone in which no military equipment or military activity should take place, that the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency should be given the uh, right of uh, access, that the uh, essential calling uh, materials such as uh, uh, water or electricity uh, to run diesel generators uh, to provide backup, uh, that these should be uh, unmolested through military activity, sanctuarized, uh, uh, if you like, that the IAEA should have the right to uh, place cameras and other inspection material uh, around these sites to constantly monitor uh, 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 the situation and be able, uh, as I mentioned, to send uh, inspection teams at short notice without the kind of petty impediments and bureaucratic obstacles that Russia put up at Zaporizhia uh, for uh, uh, many uh, uh, weeks. And that there should be much more open and transparent reporting by countries with nuclear power plants uh, on their safety requirements and the need to install upgrades. Now, already um, nuclear power plants uh, in the wake of the experiences at Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, Fukushima, uh, are much more resilient than they used to be. For example, today they're built to standards that enable them to better survive earthquakes or even uh, a plane crashing into a nuclear uh, reactor. The facilities to shut them down quickly have been improved as well. But it's not just the safety of the reactors. As I've said, uh, uh, the power lines, the cooling mechanisms are key. For example, in France this summer, uh, because of the extreme drought conditions, um, French nuclear power plants that are responsible for 60 percent of the country's electricity requirements uh, had to be uh, slowed down or switched off temporarily uh, because the water levels that provided the cooling water were uh, too uh, 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 low. So climate change is a factor here uh, as well. So we look need, once uh, we're out of the Ukrainian imbrogolio, 
uh, and we have some kind of international dialogue restored to look urgently at the notion of an international convention on the safety of nuclear power plants. It was not particularly encouraging, dear listeners and viewers, that at the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty Review Conference that closed uh, in New York uh, just before the summer break, a final declaration uh, could not be agreed because Russia would not agree to have language on this issue and Zaporizhia uh, in the final declaration. But that doesn't mean to say that we should not keep on trying. Uh, nuclear power plants may be our future, uh, but that also means that uh, we need urgently to make sure that if we are going to have more nuclear power, we're able to have it safely. Thank you for watching and listening today. And as always, look forward to engaging with you next week.